Please be seated. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I bring you greetings on behalf of our bishop in the North American Lutheran Church, Bishop Dan Selvo, and all your brothers and sisters in the North American Lutheran Church. Oddly, most people are familiar with and maybe even feel a connection to New Testament texts and passages. Most people know about the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus feeding the 5,000, and so on. But for some reason, I don't find a lot of people remember that much or connect with Old Testament accounts other than maybe creation and Adam and Eve and Noah. We read these Old Testament texts just as often in the church, but I also find preachers don't preach much on the Old as much as the New Testament these days, which is somewhat unfortunate, I think, because there are just so many passages in the Old Testament which do speak to us as to those in the New Testament. Our first lesson for today, for example, never ceases to grab hold of me and cause me to think not just about myself and my life and my circumstances, but I also think about those to whom I'm preaching week after week, and you and your life as well, because who among us hasn't at some point in life felt like sitting down under a tree Exhausted, frustrated, maybe ready to say to the Lord God, it's enough now, Lord. Take away my life. I'm ready to just be done with all this. Our account from 1 Kings describes for us the plight of Elijah, the prophet of the Lord, who just had, if you remember this account at all, who had just had a showdown with the pagan prophets of Jezebel. Herself, the pagan wife of Ahab, the errant king of Israel. And a great showdown it was as Elijah not only outdid the pagan prophets, shaming them before King Ahab and the people, but then Elijah commands the people to take hold of every one of the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah to bring them to the river where Elijah killed them all. And as you might imagine, this angered Jezebel to have the prophets of the pagan gods that she worshipped killed by the one prophet of the God of Israel. So she makes this vow. She sent a message to Elijah saying, may the gods do the same and more to me if I don't take your life by this time tomorrow. And did Elijah stand his ground after his great show of faith and trust in God, after slaying 850 false prophets, after standing before pagan gods and the king's wife, did Elijah now rise up a giant among men, a hero for the people? No. Elijah ran. And he ran like his life depended on it. Because it did. He went a day's journey into the wilderness and he came and he sat down under a broom tree ready to die of exhaustion, worry, and fear. And every time I read this text and hear this account, I can imagine each and every one of us at some time in life sitting under that tree with Elijah. I can see many of us sitting under that tree, having lost our jobs, frustrated that after many years of faithful work, we were laid off due to a worldwide pandemic. 
I can see folks who are struggling financially, having stretched the money as far as it will go and more, yet having a stack of bills to pay. I can see seniors wondering day by day how they'll continue to make it on a fixed income. And what about the military spouse at home trying to keep the family and the household together, waiting for their soldier to return from a deployment? And what about the person struggling maybe with COVID or cancer, unsure whether the treatment will work? What about the parents striving to raise their children <clears throat> while all around the kids seem to be influenced and shaped by TV and video games and the ever-present sex and violence on the internet that seems sometimes to grab hold of our young people and turn them into youth that we don't really want to have in our homes anymore. At times like Elijah, we can have flashes, we can have moments of strength and courage which cause us to do what needs to be done, to spur us on to accomplish this or that task that's in front of us. But then in the blink of an eye, there we are running scared in life. We hide, we retreat, we pull back. We sit by ourselves, curled up in a figurative fetal ball, thinking, I don't have a future. How am I going to get through this? I don't know which way to turn. Just, just take me now, Lord. Just take me now. I want it to all be over. What strikes me about this experience of Elijah is that the Bible is presenting with this story because it's universal. Even the strongest, most well-balanced, most courageous soldier in the world at some moment in life hears down deep inside a voice saying, Run! I've been reading for probably 30 or 40 years presidential biographies, and one of the things I appreciate about reading through the lives of presidents is learning how even the greatest of our presidents, in the most trying of times, still sat at times in the solitary quiet of their study, and they felt all alone, uncertain, and yes, even at times, they panicked. And what's God's response to our, our worry and our fear and our gut reaction to flee? How does God deal with this deep-seated, complex human experience? Like the proverbial Jewish mama, the Lord sent an angel to Elijah, and this was the message. Get up and have something to eat. And not only that, but the angel of the Lord provided a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So Elijah got up and he ate and drank, but then he lay right back down again. So yet a second time, the angel came to Elijah, touched him and said, get up and eat. Otherwise, the journey ahead is going to be too much for you. And then Elijah got up and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights. And where did Elijah go? To Horeb, to the Mount of God, to be in the presence of God. And where do we find that food? Is there still some food today that will strengthen you and me and encourage us and get us back on our feet? The German theologian Helmut Thielicke once told the story of a hungry man passing a store. A store with a sign in the window that said, we sell bread. So the man entered the store, he put some money on the counter, and he told the proprietor, I would like to buy some bread. To which the woman behind the counter replied, we don't sell bread. 
But the man said, the sign in the window says you do. Oh no, answered the woman. We make signs like the one in the window that says we sell bread. <laughs> Truth is bread isn't always found where it might seem to be. We see in our world today lots of places with signs that say, we sell bread. Maybe even it says, we sell living bread. People offer truth. They offer transformation. They offer redemption. When in fact, they're misrepresenting the truth and leading people astray. People offer methods that will supposedly help you to help yourself. They offer promised strategies that you can use to make yourself happy, healthier, skinnier, and ready to go again. And then there are also those like the prophets of Baal and Asherah who offer the bread of life that comes from false gods and false religions. That sex suggests you can find life-giving sustenance and nourishment in the world around you, in little carved god and goddess statues. They even promise you can find life-giving sustenance in trees and seas and birds and bees. But the greatest of all deceptions the most misleading sign of all is the sign that points you to yourself, telling you that you can do it all yourself. You can be it all, and you can accomplish it all on your own without some God lording it over you, telling you what to do, telling you how to live your life. Truth is, our culture and our world try to tell us, and they try to tell us and reinforce it again and again, that we can find life-giving bread right here in our own heart and here in our own mind with our own intellect and intelligence and effort so that we can be our own gods. You know, that was the temptation for Adam and Eve to be their own gods. So that finally we can live our lives for ourselves. We can spend our time however we want without needing a church or a Sunday worship service or a faith community or a savior outside ourselves. Our increasingly secular world reinforces for us <clears throat> that all we need is ourselves. That I can be my own bread if only I just look deeper into myself. And that sounds really good to a lot of people. It entices a lot of us until we are the ones sitting under that solitary tree with nothing left inside us to keep us going. There are lots of people in the world who try to make it on their own without no God trying to rule their lives until their legs get knocked out from under them. They get kicked in the gut. They find themselves no longer able to conjure up the inner strength and the fortitude to get themselves up, dust themselves off and get back on the road again. And this is just what our lessons are telling us this morning. That this bread of life, the word of God, this food of angels is the nourishment that will give us what we need to go in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to the Mount of God. It's no surprise really that the Jews to whom Jesus was speaking doubted him and questioned, how could it be that he could not just give them the bread of life, but how could he say that he is the bread of life, come down from heaven himself? 
They had trouble believing in Jesus because they were also having trouble believing in the Father, which is why Jesus not only talks about himself as the bread of life, but offers himself as well. So that we may not just think about Jesus as the bread of life. So that we don't just have to ponder him, imagine him, meditate on him as the bread of life, as a philosophical concept. But he offers himself to us to take and eat, to consume to have him be a part of us so that we can be nourished and strengthened for daily living. It's not just that Jesus speaks about bread of life, but that he gives us this bread saying, I am the living bread. His presence, his person, himself in his words and in his deeds in his promise to be with us always, even to the close of the age. But even more, he gives us his real presence, his very presence. As he said at the meal on Thursday of Holy Week, this is my body and pours out his blood saying, this is my blood of the new covenant. In the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus was holding up a sign that said, here is bread. In the Lord's Supper, Jesus says, take this bread. In the Lord's Supper, he provides the bread of life so that those who eat it will not just live, but live forever. Which Jesus makes plain saying, I will raise you up on the last day. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. Which is why, for us at least, the last meal we hope to eat on this earth will be the bread of life and the cup of salvation. The Lord's Supper to strengthen us and give us the courage we need to be able to get through death and arrive ourselves at that Mount of God. And when you think about it, that's why we come to the Lord's table. And this is why so many Lutheran congregations today are now offering the Lord's Supper every Sunday, as indicated in our Lutheran confessions. Because you and I never know when that Lord's Supper might be our last. So we want to have the Lord's Supper as often as we can because we hunger for Christ's presence in life. We need to be fed with Christ's presence because we never know when this Lord's Supper may indeed be the last you or I receive in this life. So pastors often bring it to the home of the dying or to the bedside of the one in the hospital taking his or her last breaths. So we eat of it so that we can feast on the Lord's body and drink of the Lord's blood so that in the strength of this food, we may be ready for the journey. We can go the distance. However far we have left to go in life. <clears throat> Martin Luther said, <clears throat> the life of the Christian is simply this. One beggar showing another beggar where to find bread. So the angel says to you, to you today, come and eat. 
in your life every day, feast on Jesus and his word. The living bread come down from heaven. Come and receive the word, which is Jesus, and then go and share that bread with other beggars like us. Share with them that bread, that Jesus, with those who also are sitting under a tree feeling like life has beaten them down and life is too much. So that you and they have strength and courage and energy for life's road ahead. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.